Well, hey there, folks. This is Dr. Andrew Franklin. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Norfolk State University. I teach a course called Clinical Methods, which is designed to orient undergraduate students to the helping skills model that's put forth by Dr. Clara A. Hill. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about the helping model that she's proposing. And uh, in doing so, it's important to not only talk about the helping model, but talk about a common factor, which is the therapeutic relationship, which is absolutely salient to client outcomes. So without further ado, let's get into the presentation. I hope you enjoy. I want to spend some time discussing the therapeutic relationship before we talk about the helping skills model in more detail. There are three parts of the relationship. Those three parts are the real relationship, the working alliance, and transference and counter-transference. I want to spend some time and talk about each of these three parts in particular because they're absolutely critical to the whole vehicle that is therapy and counseling. Uh, the real relationship is the genuine, non-distorted connection between helper and client. Think of the real relationship as being very similar to relationships outside of therapy. The therapeutic relationship or the working alliance consists of the bond, connection between helper and the client, agreement on goals, which is the consensus about changes clients want to make, and agreement on tasks consensus about what should take place during helping processes to meet goals. Transference and countertransference deals with distorted perceptions that individuals have of others based on previous relationships. When that is happening from the therapist side, it's called countertransference. When it's happening from the client side, it's transference. Imagine a relationship in which a female is explaining to her boyfriend that she is not his ex after seeing him exhibit some behavior toward her. She may have concerns that he is treating her like someone that she is not. In a way, these concepts, like I uh, just articulated, are familiar to us in everyday ways. The usage of terms to explain these dynamics build on common usage and aid mental health professionals in speaking a common language. The helping skills model is based on several theoretical models given that all of them are effective in assisting people. The three models that it is based on is listed in this slide. The model is intended to take clients down into themselves and then out into the world. Sometimes people can be like a turtle with a neck brace. They have the potential to go down into themselves, but first they may need to heal a bit. And with assistance, they can really explore their inner world and then reemerge for more effective action with the outside world. The exploration stage allows the client to fully immerse themselves in their feelings and thoughts. This is the first stage of the helping skills model Dr. Clara A. Hill is proposing. It also provides space for therapists to understand their clients as it is important to not go into sessions making assumptions regarding understanding people, even if you are similar to them. There is more variability within a culture than there is across cultures. The specific skills associated with this stage is listed in the slide. Exploration stage lays the ground for clients to understand themselves and take responsibility for change. In the insight stage, helpers work more actively with clients to help them see things in a new light. Someone could come to realize that their anger at a certain person is tied to perceived slights experienced earlier in their relationship. And they may arrive at this insight by way of working with the psychologist that's able to identify patterns in terms of how they relate to their significant other. In this stage, the therapist is looking for patterns of thinking and behaving and trying to help the client make connections that perhaps they have not seen before. Helpers want their clients to walk away with a deeper understanding of the reasons for their thoughts and feelings. The specific skills for this stage are listed in the slide. In the action stage, helpers are not experts in this particular stage, but rather they are guides. In this stage, the helper explores with the client the idea of changing, determines whether the client wants to make changes, and helps the client consider what changes to pursue. This may involve teaching clients skills that will help them make changes. You can see some of the skills for this particular stage listed in the slide. 
So in talking about the three-stage model, exploration, insight, action, and the skills that are associated with each of these stages, it's important to note that uh, there are some skills that tend to show up rather frequently. In other words, note how skills that are unique to each stage are used throughout all of the stages, just at varying levels. Also, I want you to note that skills for exploring are used at great quantities, a great amount of times across these different stages. Exploration skills are used in high quantity because the idea is to always have the client exploring. And ideally, they would be exploring in the insight stage at a deeper level. And then the client would definitely be exploring in the action stage as well. So reflecting on their thoughts and, and their behaviors as it relates to uh, the changes that they are making in their lives, whether it's uh, lifestyle changes in terms of their diet or uh, communicating more efficiently with their partners or uh, immersing themselves more into healthy study practices to achieve the grades they want in college. Uh, exploration skills are going to be used in all of these stages. It's helpful to think about the three stages of helping in sequential order for learning purposes, but in reality, there are a number of ways in which these stages may be organized. Sometimes it moves from exploration to action and then insight. On other occasions, such as what is listed in number two, additional insight may require additional exploration of how one feels about the insight, and thus there is a returning to an earlier stage. For example, if one comes to realize that they are largely resistant to their partner doing anything nice for them because their caregivers, when they were growing up, often did nice things following abuse, as a result of gaining insight, it may be necessary for the therapist to create space for the client to explore how they feel about that new insight they have accepted. So you could have exploration, insight, then back to exploration, then insight again, over and over again until the client reaches a agreed upon goal. Sometimes the situation may require immediate action and thus there's not a whole lot of exploration of thoughts and feelings initially. For example, if someone is suicidal with a plan and intent to harm themselves, then the immediate concern is their safety. So doing a lot of processing of thoughts and feelings may not be as helpful at the, get, at the start, given that their life is in imminent danger by themselves. After the fact, one can process thoughts and feelings once their physical person's safety has been ensured. This is a contextual model that highlights the helping process. This is an overview of the helping process. This model takes into consideration what each party brings to the relationship in terms of their background. Background is related to culture, and culture gets at individuals' values, beliefs, traditions, behaviors, ideologies, and diversity in its many forms. Religion, age, gender identity, sex, economic status, ethnicity, race, etc., Remember, culture is always the elephant in the room that does not need a zoo, grassland, food, or water to make its presence known. Then there's the therapeutic relationship, which is the real relationship, the working relationship, and the transference, counter-transference relationship. That working relationship, remember, is going to be really important. A bond, agreed upon goals, agreed upon tasks. This will make and break the therapeutic relationship, okay? Transference and counter-transference are, are useful tools for the therapist to use to help the client get insight into their issues and also to give the client real-time feedback in regard to how they are experiencing them. Now, note how early the therapeutic relationship is in the model. Early meaning it's further left, which in indicates that it is an antecedent or the foundation for being able to provide assistance. Then we have an arrow going to the moment by moment process. A short while ago, I watched The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. It's a show about an orphan chess prodigy named Beth Harmon who struggles with addiction in her quest to be the greatest chess player in the world. One of the things I noted in watching the series is how calculated chess players really are. They really try to gauge the intentions of the player they are playing against. 
and understand the reason why the person across from them are making moves. They rely on facial expressions and body movements of the competitors, and they deduce meaning from that in addition to the moves that they're making so that they can react as a means to elicit a certain reaction from their competitors, all with the intended goal of saying checkmate. In the same way, therapists think through their interventions or the skills that they will use on a moment by moment basis, adjusting based on what is occurring. If they desire to explore feelings, then they will use skills to do just that. If they sense from the client that they have fully explored their feelings, then they may transition transition to another stage of helping, maybe insight, or elect to explore thoughts. They gauge the reactions of the client by way of what they say and how they behave, and they carefully note that most times clients have a difficult time admitting to negative feelings or socially unacceptable feelings, and they try to be sensitive to those things because therapists, based on research, tend to not pick up on those things. Then, in between sessions, both clients and therapists are thinking about each other in different ways And the reiteration of this process will hopefully lead to good outcomes. This is a slide highlighting that it can be difficult for helpers to slow down and recognize their intentions. This is a skill that can be practiced and honed by way of recording and reviewing sessions and reflecting on a therapy session right after it has occurred. A particular note is not just the usage of the skill, but how it is used. A boyfriend could walk up to his girlfriend and say, I love you. I love you. All right. Or he can walk up to her and go, I love you, sweetheart. So what I'm getting at is the quality of the intervention, as well as how it is delivered, can make a difference. Intentions could be well. Content could be okay, But the but the delivery could cause the intervention to land in a way that does not elicit the reaction the therapist is going for. If you're striving to validate someone and make them feel understood and you forcefully say, I get it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. The intention may be good, but it may cause the client to feel misunderstood, rejected, and isolated. Client reactions to the helper can fall all along the spectrum. Everything from agree to recount an experience, to request something, to exploring, to come to insight, to resist what the client is saying, to emotional reactions such as confusion, etc. These reactions are determined by common factors, client's awareness of needs, level of pathology, and personality structure. Helpers in large part observe their client's behaviors and determine whether their interventions are helpful and make decisions about what to do next based on that information. For example, if a client came into a session to talk about being put on academic probation and the helper assisted them in exploring the emotions connected with that experience, the helper will need to assess if they need to continue to explore mixed feelings of sadness and disappointment connected with the experience, or perhaps pivot to exploring thoughts that they're having. Another option is to assist the client with some form of behavior change. This could be in the form of collaborating with the client on brainstorming a plan of how to raise one's GPA. There are many options, and the helper will have to rely on their judgment after observing the client's disposition, listening to them speak, entertaining possible requests, etc., It is generally advised to spend adequate amount of time in the exploration stage to fully understand what the client's issues are and the methods that they've tried and their reasons of why they think they're dealing with the issue before moving on to more involved stages like the insight stage and the action stage. There are 168 hours in a week. Most helping sessions or therapy sessions only occur one hour a week. If one is just reliant on the one hour spent in therapy to make changes, then that will likely not be enough. Therapists want clients to use skills they are working on outside of sessions. They want those skills to translate to various areas of their lives. In The Karate Kid, Jaden Smith is getting frustrated with the Jackie Chan character because all he is learning how to do is put on and take off a jacket. 
With the help of a guide, Jaden Smith learns that taking off a jacket is a meaningful skill that not only translates to him learning how to do Kung Fu, but it also translates to him learning how to live his life with decency and respect and integrity. In the same way, therapists hope that skills that are practiced in session will be meaningful to clients outside of their lives in a variety of ways, even if it is frustrating or a challenging experience for them to learn those skills, or they don't have a lot of insight in regard to how these skills can be externalized. In between sessions, therapists form internal representations, uh, excuse me, clients form internal representations of their therapist and use what the therapist says as a means to comfort themselves or receive guidance in their everyday lives. And when working with clients, it's important for helpers to consider all the external factors that may influence the likelihood of a client making changes in their life. Again, environment is really important and helping a client foresee and overcome possible challenges with pre-planned strategy is very important. I read the memoirs of former President Barack Obama, and one of the things he discussed in his book was the amount of time he spent behind closed doors wading through large binders of information on world affairs and thinking how he would strategize about the issues of the day prior to meeting with his cabinet. In his mind, he had ideas and representations of the issues, and privately, he thought about how to respond before getting in a group setting. If President Obama would have walked in a cabinet meeting unprepared, his approval rating would have gone down and he could be in danger of making decisions that would negatively affect the economy, foreign relations, homeland security, and various other things. For a helper to walk in a session and expect that each time they do, on the spot, they will figure out how best to help their clients would be a gross disservice. Helpers think about their clients in between sessions. It's not possible to just utilize the time directly serving the help of the client to be effective. So helpers think about their clients, try to understand them, and figure out what to do differently in upcoming sessions. Because helpers are not immune to their own stressors and challenges in life, it's important for helpers to help themselves. So burnout and compassion fatigue could occur, especially when trying to learn how to be a good helper and dealing with own well, one's own stressors. So it's important to exercise and strive to have a fulfilling personal life and get social support. All of that stuff is important. It's important for a helper to eat hamburger helper or something that will fuel them to show up for the things that matter most. On this slide, the last slide, I list out some of the outcomes associated with helping clients. Keep in mind that therapy does not provide cures, and this is how the verbal helping professions differ from that of medicine. Life in the human condition is replete with issues, challenges, and existential crises. And sometimes in seeking out therapy, things get worse before they get better, just as a seed has to crack in order to fulfill its inner potential and a caterpillar has to go through a chrysalis stage of hardening and feeling stuck or dormant before emerging as a butterfly. The goal of therapy is to help individuals be able to function better, feel better about themselves, and accept themselves more. It's important to note that the outcomes of therapy may be perceived differently. It's quite possible for a therapist to be elated about the work they've done with the client, it's possible for that same client to be relatively neutral about the work that has been done. And maybe they were just going along with things as a means of compliance. And uh, the courts that mandated them to get services, uh, it could be possible that they are happy that the client has complied. This really speaks to the power of perspective and the need to really, really explore what's going on with the client throughout the work that's been being done. And also, again, it's really important to focus on building that therapeutic relationship. So that wraps up this presentation as it relates to uh, the helping skills model. Um, there is so much information to cover, so many things that I didn't get a chance to mention, but I wanted to make sure that this presentation would be concise and informative. Hope that you check out some of my future presentations moving forward. Take care.